The Invisibles. Yeah, we're talking about it. Welcome to the Art of Comics. I'm your host, Andres Salazar. Today we're going to talk about a freaking good comic called The Invisibles. That's right, Grant Morrison, a bunch of artists that are badass. This is the book that inspired The Matrix. <laughs> Maybe not that. But this is a great book. We need to talk about The Invisibles, okay? So let's get it on. Now, if you have read any of Grant Morrison's comics, I encourage you to read Invisibles, okay? This is, uh, okay, so I did a video of Arkham Horror. Uh, go check out Arkham Asylum, sorry. Arkham Asylum, Arkham Horror is a board game. <laughs> it's different, totally different. Arkham Asylum, go check out my video about that with him and Dale Keown, uh, wonderful book. This, I think, is, is it his best? Oh gosh. I like a lot of Grant Morrison stuff. I like a lot of it. Um, this might be his best. Just a straight up original. Um, came out in 93, 94. This was good. This is good. And it, I just read this this week. Let's get into this because I gotta talk about this. This is a good book. And my dust jacket is upstairs so you don't need to worry about that. It's just, trust me, it's got Brian Bolin art so it's good. Uh, let's dive down and talk about the Invisibles, sirs and mamses. Let's do it. Okay, people, thank you for checking out the video here on the Art of Comics. Um, you've heard me talk about Grant Morrison before. Uh, Scotsman. Uh, is it Scotsman or Scottish? Either of those, I think, work. Um, kind of esoteric guy, into magic. Uh, very dapper dressed guy, likes punk, you know, Ziggy Stardust, whatever. Um, Well-read, erudite writer, came ab aboard. I think he wrote for Warrior and a bunch of other things. Kind of that new wave, British new wave that Karen Berger was involved with, you know, in the late 80s, mid 80s. Um, Vertigo started, you know, Vertigo was kind of, the, you know, Swamp Thing was kind of like the uh, the beginning of that kind of Vertigo line that uh, Karen Berger was involved with. And this became one of the first Vertigo books, Invisibles. <clears throat> and it really is good. And uh, I'm going to spoil this first, this first set of 12 issues. So we're just going to just bang in on this, just suck it up and deal with it. If you haven't read this, go get it. It's very good. Um, again, I, as I said, I read it just recently and it works very well still. Um, the, the little little jab about uh, Matrix I said in the beginning, there was talk that there are some themes and concepts in Matrix and those guys, the Wachowski brothers, they, uh, are really into you know manga and comics and all that stuff so clearly all those things influence them now whether this was a particular source material for that movie I can't say and I think the jury's out on that I don't think they ever publicly cite it as a source but um, there's some really cool ideas that they both share and so uh, I ain't hating on nobody uh, we're gonna go through a bunch of artists. The first artist that starts off the first like um, kind of four issues is Steve Yoel, and uh, I don't know much about him. Comment below. That's gonna be my go-to. Comment below uh, if you know something about Steve. I'm not too hip on him, and I probably should have read some Wikipedia before this, but you know what? Sometimes you go crazy. I like the painted covers though in this book. Um, that's always nice, and I think this is a right. You know, this is 1994. This is right when the kind of painted covers, artsy fartsy world, Sandman, you know, stuff like that is coming on board and becoming more mainstream. And so this book really does some of that. You know, I, be I believe, you know, Grant Morrison does inv Invincible, excuse me, Invisibles, Doom Patrol, Animal Man, a bunch of projects around this time. Uh, I think this is the one that to me just really, 
sticks out straight. Again, I really like this graphic stuff. I really dig this kind of graffiti, graffiti art stencil stuff. It just adds to it. We're going to start off this whole story talking about Dale. And Dale becomes a member of the Invincible, um, Invisibles. Damn, I'm going to keep saying Invincibles. It's going to tick me off. Invisibles. So we're going to kind of go through his initiation or his kind of like inter his um, process of joining the Invisibles, this kind of secret spy network trying to uh, get the people unplugged from the corruption of the world and so forth. So we go through his transformation into a character. His code name will be Jack Frost. So he Dale is a hooligan, you know, for the lack of a better word and term. He's just, he, you know, Molotov cocktails. He's burning stuff down, arsonist. He's just a jerk. We're also seeing these these um, graffiti of King Mob. And King Mob's going to be an important character. That actually was a group of anarchists in the 60s. Uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, do much of an impact. But in, in the UK, there was a little small anarchist group in the 60s called King Mob. And I think that's where uh, Grant gets that idea for that name. And so we see this a couple times, this King Mob uh, thing. And now he, this is King Mob here, Gideon. That's his. That's the name they're using for him. I don't know what his Christian name is, but Gideon, aka King Mob, is talking to Edith, and and we're starting to just get this idea that they're the secret super society of you know agents that are out there trying to save the world, save individuals somehow from this um, corruption. We don't really know, even by the issue 12, we don't really know the whole story of what's going on, but we get these ideas of like, okay, something's going down. There are those who are kind of like plugged in and those who are kind of um, emancipated from the shackles of society, right? So it's got that, it's got that blue pill, red pill matrix feel of like, you know, we're all grinding in the machine, but there are those who are enlightened who are in a, a higher state of culture or, or higher state of uh, enlightenment who kind of know the true path and kind of can see the demons from the truth in the world. And so we're kind of kind of getting that. And we even start off actually with some very esoteric like Egyptian thought and different ideas of these sacred beetles. And so he's right away, Grant is introducing a lot of real mythology and um, kind of background to the story. So I, I dig that. I dig all the kind of history and mythology and and uh, supernatural stuff. Dale meets, you know, he sees uh, John and this is, I think this is the fifth Beatle. I don't remember his name, but he's going to wind up leaving, leaving the band of the Beatles. And if, you know, are they the real? Is this really John? Or is this a ghost, right? So we kind of start questioning reality here. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, Dale can kind of see these spirits. So we know that he's somehow touched or he's got the shin in, you know, which is kind of cool because uh, there's also, when you have the shin in, you also have kind of evil spirits that are after you. So there's this, you know, uh, darkness that follows him. Okay, we're going a little further. He's still into hijinks. Uh, he's, you know, doing stuff. Now, I feel like the art is also cool too because um, Steve really changes up some of the art style, you know, especially having fun with the psychedelic stuff. And I think in a way, this is a way for Grant to really just play with pop culture. A lot of pop culture in this, a lot of references to you know, you're going to have references to Gandhi and philosophy, but also like pop stars like John Lennon and the magic of music and the magic of drugs and all those kind of things. So that's kind of neat. Um, of course, Dale's making, he's choosing, having bad choices, making wrong choices and um, have an altercation with his teacher who's actually just trying to do the best thing for him, help him out. And Dale's going to be an ass and kick shit out of him. And because of that, he's going to... I guess the UK's version of, um, you know, um, uh, jail for children, what do you call it, juvie hall type of a deal. So he goes to this Harmony House, which is a almost like a 
clockwork orange style of deprogramming you know children into becoming more subservient or more um, in tune with society but of course they're gonna lose some autonomy and some free will because of that and we think that is evil and as we see this guy he is an evil bastard now King Mob Gideon is now meeting up with some other characters we will meet this character uh, Raggedy Ann and so we're getting a couple more, a couple more pieces in the in the chess. We see some again this uh, horrific deprogramming that's kind of scary, and uh, we now see that this guy, the head like headmaster of the school, the Harmony House, uh, has some relations with demons, and this demon is real, and it gets pretty dark and heavy. This book is mature. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. <clears throat> it's not super dark. It's not like hostile or anything, but you know, there's a couple dark, there's some dark stuff in it. Um, I, I find it very horrific. I mean, it, it, there's horror elements to it, which I really like because it's, it's got the horror, it's got some action. It's just a really good story, man. Um, so King Mob comes and breaks him out. He doesn't even know the kid, right? He knows that he's special. He's the chosen one. Maybe he's Neo, whatever you want to say, and he's going to get him out. So he goes, breaks him out. Uh, there's some killing involved. And this guy knows him, and he's like, okay, what's going on here? And uh, shoots him dead. Gets him out, and now we see, okay, he is King Mob. And he's the guy that he's been seeing this. Yeah, the correctional facility. Okay, so they go out, and he's like, hey, who are you? Are you can help me out. Don't worry. It's all good. I want you to join the Invisibles. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm out. Okay, you guys are weird. You're a strange dude. Thanks for breaking me out. But I ain't joining nothing. And that's it. Now he's like on his own. Page uh, issue two. Again, I really like these, these covers. Now we see it's probably at least six months, maybe a year, maybe more. He's on his own. I say by his hair's by his hair, he's at least a couple years, I would say, just because of the eye, his eyes and such. So he's a little older, he's been living on the street on his own, and Dale is uh, down and out in heaven and, or, excuse me, in heaven and hell. He's panhandling, doesn't know what to do, doesn't have a job, doesn't have education, is a total ass, and this is his life. Turns out he meets this fella here, and this old, old guy, um, is going to turn out to be a, he's basically going to be a mentor. He's the Gandalf, you know, Mad Tom is going to show him the way. And it turns out he's going to be an invisible. So Mad Tom, okay, so he's getting into trouble here. Mad Tom saves him from the trouble, takes him down and starts to show him what life's like and what this is about and talks about Jack Frost. And he's like, I don't know who Jack Frost is. And so that's gonna be a recurring thing. Kind of a, he meets this uh, cross-dresser or transvestite named um, Fanny. Um, and so we're gonna find out that Fanny's actually invisible as well. So that's what's kind of cool though, I have to admit, I do like that Grant, this was 94, you know, this wasn't entirely revolutionary, but it was pretty new. It's pretty, you know, he's got characters who are, you know, he's got this character who's trans, he's got all these different kind of, different types of people, black, white, what have you, and it's very diverse. It's very much kind of the outcasts of society, and I like that, and that's kind of neat. And back then, this especially, this was cool. So, uh, I mean, nowadays, almost every group is a bunch of outcasts, right? And everything's diversified. But back here in 94, not so much. This was pretty, pretty new stuff. Um, so I dug that. There's also these writing, these like um, fox hunter writing, writing guys. And uh, they're after these, these homeless, you know, delinquents. And... Uh, we don't know why, what's going on, but something supernatural is going on with that too. So uh, Mad Tom is taking Dale down into the tunnels. 
under London and kind of learning. Now we're starting to get this kind of magic elements, totems and things like that. We get introduced to this blue um, moss that has some kind of psychedelic power. So we don't really know, and we have Barbaleth too. Barbaleth is kind of a code word. It is some sort of uh, secret name that's gonna unlock some powers we're trying to figure out. It has to do with aliens. We haven't really figured all this out yet. But so we're really playing with hallucinogenics, you know, secret societies, magic, all these kind of things in this spy world. Uh, it's really neat, man. And I, like, I think the art is not like super pop. And this isn't like one of my masters of art. This isn't Bill Sienkiewicz, but it totally works. I think it's good. I think it's, I think it's fine. I ain't got a problem with it. I think it holds up. Uh, it's not distracting. It's just what you need, okay? It's not, is it the best? No, but it's good. Um, Tom's gone, by the way. Where's Tom? Uh-oh, what's happening here? Now they're after him. So we got a problem. These uh, poofy dudes, uh, you know, are going to beat on him. And what's he going to do? He's going to get jacked up. And they disappear. What is going on? And uh, there's Mad Tom. He gives them this little blank button. Blank button means uh, it's potentially like it's the Masonic ring, you know? It is like you remember the, the clan or the group, the society, if you have this. He's still not sold on it. Uh, again, this is... This whole, these whole first four issues is his introduction to the society and Tom kind of unfolding what the world really is about and unfolding his, unlocking his powers. And now he can see like a pigeon and kind of like can see things more clearly. So we're having this mentor, mentee, you know, pupil, Padawan relationship, which actually is really cool and turns out neat. And so they um, discuss philosophy in the world and why he should join the uh, Invisibles and such for a while. And every now and then we'll see some ghosts or some other characters that are going to kind of mix in at times. And he's going to challenge him and he's going to make him drown and he's going to do these things to take him to the edge. And it's when he's at the edge that he's going to unlock some kind of power. And... Uh, he sees nothing there. And it really breaks his down, his society. His He breaks him down emotionally. and So there's a lot of neat psychology in here as well. And um, I really like the way you kind of get a feeling for this kid and who he is and what he's gone through. So I really dig that a lot too. And... Uh, and now we're now we're keep keep on going. So now it's been some it's been some time. They're hanging out. They're buddies now. He's really taken Matt Tom as a as a mentor, and um, but he's you know he's still defiant to join. You know he's not going to be called Jack Frost. He's not joining this group. He's not about that. He's a loner. He's a solo guy. He's not he's not doing it. You know. So um, we'll see how long that holds up. Okay, I'm gonna, I've already spent 16 minutes. I don't want to go crazy on this, but this is really a great book. I'm going to stop here and just kind of skim a little bit more. I don't want to just read the whole freaking book. Um, basically, we start getting now to um, Tom is Tom is gone. They jump off this building. He's gone. He doesn't know what's going on. But now he's getting introduced to Fanny and Boy and King Mob and Raggedy Ann. And he's they're like, hey, we need the fifth member. You're the fifth member. We lost somebody. You're it. You need to join. And he's still, you know, not about that. We go into another art, art style, and I really like this artist. This particular is a great panel, but I really dig this artist. Oh, yeah, this is Duncan uh, Fregetto. He did uh, some Clerks comics, some Hellboy comics. He is active and a great artist. And this was back in 94. I really loved his stuff. Um, so now this is kind of more of a Gideon story. We learn a little bit more about Mad King. Uh, excuse me, uh, King Mob. 
And then it flashbacks too to these these kind of philosophers. Some there's some definite you know uh, he's getting trained by boy. Um, they meet. This is where they meet uh, the Marquis de Sade. So we learn about, the, I think this is where the movie Marquis de Sade, and there's this uh, demon called Orlando, who goes by Orlando. He, uh, Morrison's using a lot of um, Aztec, Mayan, Incan kind of gods pantheon for their demons and such. And so we do get a lot of those names like Zeppi and things like that, which I thought was cool because... You know, I'm working on a graph. I'm working on a new novel called Nagual, which is all based in kind of this uh, fantasy world, but in the Aztec world. And so it's kind of neat to hear these names like, "Oh, I know these guys. I studied these too." So that's always neat when he's bringing different cultures and different cultures pantheons in. Um, so the art kind of moves as these different story arcs in these first twelve issues to different artists. Uh, Jill Thompson does a number of these issues as well, which turns out well. Um, yeah, this is all the, the Marquis de Sade story. And um, they meet him. They're going to bring him back into the modern world to San Francisco, which is um, kind of interesting. Yeah, here he is here. This gets really heavy and dark, um, to say the least. This is probably the darkest issue with the Marquis de Sade and kind of what he's all about and some of his writings and ideas. Um, yeah, this whole stuff here, this must be, a lot of this be taken from the some of his writings. And I'm not so much into the, the S&M stuff and that kind of, those levels of, of torture and pain and rape and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's very dark, um, but you know, that's the story, so warning on that, on that one. Um, uh, again, I do like the art, though. There's some great moments here. And he really does, the artist does a great job of doing Fanny because it would be easy to draw Fanny just as a woman, but it's a guy who's a, who's a transvestite or cross-dresser, and so he's dressing like a girl, but he keeps the face and the body really good, masculine features um but with you know dressed as a woman and that's not easy that sounds easy that's really hard to do that's really hard to do in a comic so i really like that again look at these great great covers um yeah now here we are marquis de Sade is now in our time in san francisco and he's kind of like uh bringing his his stank into the world and what he's up to what he's all about um and then we have the demon Orlando. He's causing havoc. This reminds me a little bit of some Sandman around that era. It's kind of these those kind of stories. So there is a little bit of play. It, it just rem there. I think it's because uh, this some of the stuff is based in, you know, actual literary figures and people similar to Sandman does, right? You know, the story in Sandman where William Shakespeare's in it and things like that. So it does remind me of Sandman in that way. I think that's probably about it. I won't say that one took the other. Uh, they just, you know, when you're putting in these kind of uh, people from history and they came out about the same time, you start thinking, like, oh wow, these guys are the, you know, something's in the water. And so, um, it's a great story. And then, uh, let's see, what else we got? Who's it? Yeah, this is more Jill Thompson. I really like Jill Thompson stuff, too. She had a, a number of different inkers. Her art style's a little, maybe it could be considered a little rough, but I don't know. I dig it. I think it's just right. Look at that face. That's great. Right there. I mean, she's got great expressions. And there's some, there's some neat effects in there. I mean, yeah. And this is where we get into the really, like, actiony stuff and you know trying to get out of get out of dodge and he's still not quite okay this one is a great story and i'll just take a couple more minutes to talk about this one this story is about um gosh how do i describe it we're going into kind of the world of the hoodoo you know haitian voodoo priestess world 
um, and how that's connected to kind of like modern society and such. And so there's this evil cabal of white men. There are these black kids and, you know, being killed on the street. Why is that? Well, the voodoo priestess, you know, Bruja is going to, you know, you know, going to summon the mambo, you know, summon the... Um, the spirit of vengeance, so to speak, to come in and, and kick some ass for her. So she gets him to, you know, investigate why are all the black black young men being killed on the street by the cops. And it turns out that, well, there's this, you know, classic evil cabal of powerful white men who are using these bodies to feed these demons and get power from them and they control their bodies. And so using you know, virtual reality goggles, they can control the, the, the black kids, they do crimes and rape and pillage and such. And so it's quite fascinating. It's actually a really, really good story. And this spirit of vengeance dude is going through these dimensions trying to find these guys who are like in these just gestated eggs and, you know, their spirit, their souls are in these pods and they're trying to break them out to go back to their original body. And those bodies are being possessed by the white dudes with the VR, you know, goggles. And so, uh, it's, it's pretty rough, but it's actually really cool. And there's like, some neat little message about race and such. And, uh, <clears throat> I dug it. I dug it a lot. It was, this was a one and done issue. The invisibles are not even in this. Uh, but I dug it a lot. It's pretty, pretty great. This is another one. The invisibles are not in. So he sparses out these these issues with kind of more on the world building and this one here royal monsters is kind of the world building with that that group of evil you know um bureau not bureaucrats but aristocrat you know hunters or or fox is it fox hunting or whatever you call it um and so so we learn about one of their servants and there's a kind of monstrosity that lives in the castle that they have to feed and, and such. And it's really kind of neat. Again, a lot of heart in these stories too and relationships and this father trying to get the love of his kid and she betrays him, but then they betray the kid. And I mean, it's just really classic. And this one, oh my gosh, this one is probably my favorite. Uh, I just read this a couple nights ago. This man, it's just so good. It's just about the, uh, the 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 trials of this kid growing up, going to war, coming back as a as a vet, dealing with the frustrations of of life, and having a kid born with uh, with MS or no, excuse me, with cerebral palsy, and all the challenges of all those things, and the violence, and how he become he actually becomes one of the security guys that King Mob shoots in the beginning of the story, and it's his life. It's like, what would be the life of one of the security grunts? And it goes through his life, and it goes back and forth, and it's really, really powerful. And um, man, I just can't tell you enough about this particular issue I felt was really, really good. So there you go, this is Invin uh, Invisibles. First book, first 12 issues, H highly, highly recommend this book. Um, I'll probably do the other ones too. I'm in the middle of reading the second one. Love it. Thanks a lot, you guys. Subscribe to the channel and all that. Thanks.